Before reading the gospel text this morning, let me share a story with you about an absent-minded professor who got on a train leaving Grand Central Station in New York, and after a while, the ticket conductor came by, and the professor searched his pockets, could not find the ticket. By this time, the ticket conductor recognized him and said, Oh, Professor Einstein, it's you. It's fine. I'll get it later. But Einstein continued searching, dumping out his briefcase, frantically searching for the ticket. No, really, Professor Einstein, it's fine. I know you. I'll get it later. Professor Einstein said, I have to find the ticket because I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> well, it's good to know where we're going, isn't it? And we are in chapter three of the book that we're reading for this series called And, The Gathered and Scattered Church. And today we're looking at ways of being a non-consumer driven church. The author defines consumerism as the self-focused drive to get as much as we can with the least amount of effort. Well, today's gospel story is the complete opposite of consumer driven anything. So listen for the word that God speaks to you this morning from Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her, and said to her, Do not weep. And he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up, and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. This very detailed gospel story begins with a caravan of Jesus followers meeting a funeral procession, an intersection of life and death, where life meets death. It's a miracle story, but it's not a consumer-driven miracle story. There are no pleas for more wine, more signs, more miracles, instead sounds of sobbing. No crowds presenting their sick at Jesus' feet wanting to be healed, instead bystanders standing still, awestruck in wonderment. There are no demon-possessed, mentally ill persons crying out for attention. Instead, Jesus' calming, prophetic words. Mother, here is your son. There's no free food, no multiplication of the lo loaves and fishes. Instead, all gather in a celebration of life. Death is overcome, new life is given. The widow in this story has not asked Jesus for anything. 
Jesus has not asked anything of the widow. He does not ask her what she wants, her ethnicity, even if her son was worthy of this healing. Jesus had compassion for her. The NIV translation says, his heart went out to her. The Greek word for compassion is, is a long word I can hardly pronounce, but it's a very visceral word. It means feeling the pain with, in a sinking feeling that goes through your body so that you feel the suffering in a very physical way with the person in pain. Jesus asked nothing of her, only to tell her, do not weep. This was to prepare her, to get her attention for the new thing God was going to be doing in her life. He didn't say to her, stop that crying. That would have been the opposite of compassion. Jesus meant to console her. And through God's power working in Jesus, God brings her son back to life. Not for the son's sake, but for her sake. Because in those days, uh, a widow without any means of support, and her son would have been her only support, she would very soon have been destitute, hungry, living on the margins of society. The loss of a child must be the worst kind of pain. I remember sitting with a single mother for hours and hours and hours after she had received the news that the small plane that her son was piloting along with his instructor and one other person had gone missing off the Newport coast. They were presumed dead. I didn't tell her not to weep and I wish I could have given her son back to her. I was pregnant at the time, and so my husband said, I, I think it's time to go home now. Because in our compassion, we have to remember to take care of ourselves. So compassion and care go together. Compassion and self-care. Otherwise, we'd all get sick from compassion fatigue. Jesus balanced compassion and care too when he would retreat from the crowds or go off with his disciples or take a trip on a boat or go into the garden to pray and be alone with God. In today's global economy there is enough suffering and mortality to go around. Just this month, 1,000 refugees died trying to cross the Mediterranean to a safe haven. This past week, another shooting, murder, suicide. Oh, would that some person would have had compassion on that mentally ill young man in his time of need. There's a new virus affecting newborns, and we read stories of filicide. The Gospel story today is a confirmation of God's compassion and care for us. And the good news is that we are not our own. We are chosen by God. We are chosen by Christ. We do not choose Christ. We have been chosen 
for a purpose. And that purpose, to serve God and to serve one another. We are chosen to continue Christ's ministry of compassion and to do so wherever and whenever we can, but keeping in mind our own self-care. Chosen by God is a reformed doctrine that we call election. We are chosen and elected for service. Throughout salvation history, God chose people to further the good news, starting with Abraham and Sarah, called out of Egypt, kings, prophets, judges, prophets like Elijah, who also raised a widow's son as we continue the story that we read this morning. God in Christ chose Paul to be transformed as witness to the Gentiles. So often, election is not worn as a badge of honor. It's not a sticker that we put on like when we vote this coming Tuesday. Not that kind of election. Although I am excited to vote as my first time as a new citizen of this fine country. But I'm speaking theologically now. Election is to live into God's call because you are God's chosen. Now John Calvin, one of the fathers of the Reformation, wrote a lot about the biblical concept of election. And he believed in predestination. Now predestination is often confused with predeterminism. So if something is predetermined, then everything has been set out for you and that's your path and there's no off-ramp, no on-ramp. It's predetermined. No free will. Calvin taught that in predestination, yes, we have a God-given destination, but along that way we have free will. So predestination doesn't mean we give up our free will. Because we have a loving God who goes before us, a loving God who is with us, who trusts us and loves us enough to do the right thing and points us in the right direction. One of my non-consumer ways is not subscribing to cable TV or satellite TV. I just don't need hundreds of channels. I do watch TV, and um, when PBS comes in through the airwaves, um, there's a program right now I'm watching called Thinking Like a Genius with Stephen Hawking, the great scientist who has taught us so much about the galaxies. And it's, it's a fascinating program because each week he has three volunteers uh, work on these challenges that he's predetermined, and they come to the same solution and conclusions that he's been working all his life on. But these experiments are great because they make the, the theory accessible to us. Um, one experiment particularly caught my attention because it uh, tests the law of gravity. And I tested that in my kitchen yesterday by accidentally dropping my spice jar. So it broke. Um, so yes, the apple does fall from the tree. But when he took that law and applied it at a micro level, the test was to see if that same law applies. Okay, here's the disclaimer. I am not an astrophysicist, so bear with me as I try to explain this. So amazingly, 
when the experiment was broken down to its smallest particle, subatomic quark, it seemed that the quarks didn't want to play by the rules. They did their own thing acting randomly. So we have both and. We have the overarching law that keeps us on Earth that's determined, but yet at the micro level, we have these quarks acting randomly. And I thought, what a great illustration of free will. I always knew you were a little quirky. <laughs> so we have free will within the grand scheme of things, a God-given destiny. However, we act randomly sometimes, and that's because we have free will. Yet God works out the larger plan through us, God's chosen people. And we have access to God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Amazing. Brilliant. As we move from fans to followers, God invites us to put our faith in Christ the prophet above all prophets. Elijah was a great prophet. Then we have John the Baptist in the New Testament. A prophet pointing to Jesus and still wondering before his death, are, are you the one that we're expecting? God's prophet, Jesus Christ, the elect one. In a non-consumer driven church, we move from consumer to contributor. As God's chosen, we all have something to contribute. Compassion and self-care, giving and taking. We must keep the balance. And practicing compassion may be difficult for, for some. It may be a small miracle for those who are not used to practicing compassion. But think of ways and the times when you have received compassion. And how did that feel? What if in all your dealings, compassion was a priority. I wonder how the world would be different. So in our random acts of kindness, having compassion in Jesus' name is the means by which we continue Christ's ministry and do what we've been chosen to do. The poet Maya Angelou once wrote that she was amazed at people who boast that they are saved. You are a Christian, she asks, already? Because yes, it is a process of becoming and living into. And so many people start and stop their spiritual formation when they say, I believe. When we understand ourselves to be God's chosen, we move from being consumers out into the world as missionaries. Jesus taught that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And as we move from consumers to missionaries, the mission field is as close as the neighbor sitting next to you, or as far away as the ends of the earth. We are called to go with compassion and do compassion, having compassion for all. 
In the name of our God who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us. Amen.